Hi, and uh, welcome to this video lecture on going from reality to the world of discourse. Um, or if you wish, how to create a geospatial conceptual data model. Um, or if you wish, how to create ontologies for geospatial data models. The key thing in this video lecture is that we will be talking about how we can transform our reality. And in this case, for sake of discussion, I have taken my favorite painting, uh, Hunters in the Snow by Peter Bruegel the Elder from 1565. Um, it's a painting of a Flemish landscape um, in uh, what's called a small ice age. And, um, and it's, it's interesting because it, that it's not, it's not a place that exists in reality. It has nowhere where we have this typical Flemish lowlands and an alpine mountain range in so close a connection. So, so it is a, a imagination, a visualization. Um, but let's say this is our reality. And what we want to do is that we will use this to construct ontologies or construct a on conceptual model of what we find interesting in this painting. So uh, first of all, um, there are three components in a geospatial uh, conceptual model or in an ontology if you wish. Uh, first of all, there are entities um, for, and these entities, they have properties. So uh, the entities are typically, let's say buildings or trees or people or lakes and the building could have a use. Uh, so the building is a, um, in the foreground is a old pub or inn and there is a building that is a church and there's a building that is a water mill. So they will, so the use would be the property of the building. Um, our uh, property, our entities can also have relations to our entities. So a, um, a water mill can be next to a stream. But that will, we'll cover that in a much later video. Um, this thing about having relationships. Um, we can have an R type of element in our ontology or in our conceptual model that we call a categorical partitioning. A categorical partitioning is, partitioning means parts, breaking up into parts based on some way of classifying. So making categories that bake, that divides into parts. So in this case, we could have, let's say the land form, we could have a, a lowland, a marshland, we could have a hill area, and we could have a mountain area. Um, and all of these could be based on classifying how the elevation is, or we could just have a high range mountain and the low LA, uh, land, again, simply based on classifying the elevation data. And finally, we could have property fields, um, which is something that is ever present and is varies continuously. So for instance, temperature, air pressure, and in this case, we could look at elevation. So we talked about using elevation in our categorical partitioning. So we could have elevation in meters per sea over sea level, that would have the lowland going over into some low hills going into mountains. But the, pro the property field would be elevation in meters above sea level, for instance. Uh, if you look at these three, there is some form of, um, of scale in them. They're going from um, entities which are discrete they're spatially discrete. Um, we can even have um, entities on top of each other. So um, if we had an entity describing when there was a fire, uh, forest fire, the same air could be covered by forest fires in different years. So we would have entities overlapping. Um, the categorical partitioning, they are, will always meet because there's a classification system. They will not overlap. So in that way, they will do expand the whole surface. And then finally, we have property fields. 
which are spatially continuous for completely varying. So we have that is this gradient from spatial discrete to spatial continuous. Okay, if we now look more closely at um, sorry the look at the uh, entity type and see what what are they? So the entity type that is the buildings. So we have an entity type called buildings. We could have an entity type called lake or stream or land cover or whatever. Um, they are um, entities are descriptive of a some form of of, of entities. Um, so um, whatever they could be, and um, they're typically tangible, but they can also be. Um, be uh, abstract such as municipalities or countries or nations or whatever so they can also be abstract uh, objects in our world of this course or our no, rebuilding here so um, but typically they are tangible um, and we talked about them having attributes and so on um, they're typically we will typically give our entity types a everyday language a name such as building but there will typically be more uh, precise definitions um, for instance if you have a row of in a, in a town with different buildings next to each other when is it one building or when does it break into multiple buildings um, do we count um, cycle sheds as buildings um, and lots and lots and lots in this um, GODK which is the main a topographical data set of Denmark. Um, if you look at that, we will find some examples of how we precisely define um, these different elements. So different countries will have different data sets with this concept of having everyday night, some everyday language names, but with specific meanings. Um, for instance, a forest does not necessarily have to have trees in it because in the Danish definition of a forest, it's an area that has been or will again be covered by trees. So after the trees have been harvested, there will be a period with no trees, but it will still be a forest. Um, these have properties, heights, names, whatever, as I mentioned earlier, and they are typically represented by a geometric objects. It can be uh, points, lines, or polygons, or areas, as I mentioned in, in the introduction video. So, because we can have um, some of the Danish municipalities consist of many small islands, so they will have many small areas that together represent the entity of a, um, of that municipality. So, polygons is an it, 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 we normally talk about them but polygons, but it's strict and mathematically it's not correct to talk about them as polygons, but areas. Um, but they can also be um, represented as 3D complex elements, so they have buildings um, as a 3D model of that building. Categorical partitions are basically um, based on we have a series or one or more property fields that we classify okay so we all have some classification system here at the top we um, see the, the, the international soil classification which uh, it's based on clay and loom and so how much of the dis different components organic material that are in the sample and based on that classification we can decide which soil type it is or it can be as simple as classifying uh, water as fresh water or brackish water or salt water based on the percentage of salt or the parts per million of salt in the solution. So um, categorical partitions they have are based on a series of measurements of properties and then they through a classification system become areas so an area of sandy loom or a area of brackish water. Our property fields are continuous. Um, they rep represent the individual properties, so the salinity, the air temperature, the elevation and so on. 
um, but they can also represent um, derived property things such as density or probability. So in this case, um, I have a, uh, a made a visualization of the of the density of criminal offenses in a in an area in Denmark. One thing that will be important throughout this course is that we'll be, that we'll be talking about documentation. Um, really few people working with geospatial data work alone. They will typically be working in organizations and it's important to pass on your information to other people in the, in the organization. Or if you're working alone, you might have a holiday if you're lucky and um, you come back to your work month later and oh what was I doing what was the basis of this so documentation is really important um, and I will throughout this video these video lectures stress how we can document the individual things so in this case um, it will be important to document um, which entity types are part of our conceptual model, so buildings, trees, and so on. But we'll all, and, and how are they described in more detail? So do they include outhouses, cycle sheds, and so on? How high does it have to be for a bit? Is a underground parking storage a building? All of these things has to be described because otherwise people don't know what you mean by a building. Um, we have to describe our attributes. So what their height, roof material, window type, and um, how they are classified. Or if it's a tree, we um, have to define that what we mean by a tree. And um, we might also have to, or we'll also have to again here, define which attributes we register in our conceptual model. Okay. Remember, this is at the conceptual model. We will go, there will be more documentation as we go into digital representations and so on. We can do this by um, by describing it, or often we use some form of diagramming. Um, I personally use some variation of a entity relationship diagram and ER diagram, um, combined with what is called a multidimensional or a star diagram, um, because the standard uh, ER diagram has lots of things that I'm not showing here. But it also lacks some really important things that we often use when we talk about geospatial data. So in diagramming, we use the square for the entity type, the oval for our property, so our building having a height. And then we have these dimensional properties. That's one of those things that is not in the standard entity relationship modeling, um, but I've taken from the star diagrams. We have a star, so it's a property, and that property is dependent on different dimensions. So for instance, if you have a municipality, it will have values for its population for different years. So what was the population in 2018? What was the population in 2017, 16, and so on? So we represent this type of multidimensional attribute by a star where the dimension is a property of the star. Okay, So that's the dimensional property, something a property that has different values based on another property, another dimension property. And finally, another thing that is not in the standard ER diagramming, namely the property field. The property field, such as elevation, salinity, and so on. Um, if you look at some examples of this, we could have a building have, as our entity type, with a property describing the height of it and the roof material. So that will be the building as a square connected to two ovals representing the roof material and the height. Or if you look at this case I was talking about before with the municipalities, we will have a municipality as our entity type and each of these municipalities, they have a dimensional property of property or population, sorry, so we have a dimensional property giving how many people live in that municipality, the population of the municipality for each year. So that the year is the dimension of that dimensional property population. 
in addition to these things uh, we will have to specify some more elements in um, in the geographical aspect of it um, I want in time if, if we have geospatial data because one important thing is also specifying which position we need okay um, so are the buildings precise within one meter or 10 meters or five meters or are dates precise within plus minus five days or 10 days or whatever so we will have to look at specifying a position of our attributes so we will also do that in our documentation so this is what we will call a desired position um, and we'll also there's another special thing which we'll call resolution is how precise are we going to be we're not going to register everything in the world so um, we say how small a building you know is is it and typically this is what we call a minimum mapping unit so um, buildings less than 10 square meters they are not registered for instance that's the example in the Danish uh, definition of a building that buildings if they are less than 10 square meters they are not registered um, so we have in addition to specifying which entities and which properties they have we also specify the resolution and the position of our property so resolution is specific for those that are dimensions so time and space but position will have basically any of our attributes we'll have to specify a desired position so amplify and sum this up with some um, some examples um, and we'll look at some different uh, examples here we had our building have a use so we have our inn we'll have a house for worshipping we'll have a house for grinding corn uh, in a watermill um, so they will have the geometry polygon and they'll have a use our trees will have the geometry a point and they might have a property specifying the species and the height of the tree we could have a property field um, specifying elevation and from that we could derive a categorical partitioning say mountains so if the elevation is more than in England it's uh, 300 feet then they call it a mountain um, so that will be a classification of elevation going into um, in, 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 into the uh, so in, 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 in into a categorical partitioning finally we have um, as an example a road that could have um, a paving which material is on the road and that would be of the geometry type um, line one thing that's important to remember is that there is always more than one correct solution um, we could have um, first of all we could have different points of view so um, we could look at these water bodies um, as lakes so we could have polygon representation of lakes or if we were interested in uh, recreational uh, activities we could classify we could have a entity type called skating area where we could represent our, um, our again our water bodies as skating areas it's also always a dilemma well or not to represent this have um, single elements such as lakes or should we look at a more broader concept such as land use so we could have different land use of a type so we could have lakes towns marsh areas mountains forest and so on and then giving it a type on it in general um, we would say that um, that if we have the same properties for all of our entity types that it would be reasonable to aggregate them to a higher level so if we bought all of our land use types register the same properties um, then it's fine to aggregate um, as long as it gives sense makes sense so we don't aggregate things into a thing 
that seldom makes sense. So aggregate, if you have the same properties on all your entity types and that the aggregation name makes sense, then it might be a good idea to aggregate. Um, so if we look at recreational, we could have a type of recreational, skating, skiing, hunting, whatever, as recreational, it was not recreational in, in, um, in this period. Um, the only thing they, they caught was a, got from the hunting was a fox, doesn't taste nice. Um, but, so, but if they had different things, so if we wanted to have a recreational area and if it was a skating area, we wanted to say uh, which, uh, how many people there were, but if it was a ski hunting area, we do not want to register how many people are there. So we, had, we don't have the, the same property in both situations, then we will not aggregate to the general class. We will stay at the individual types of the entity class. So aggregating or non-aggregating, it's something that is always a trick and it's something that comes through practice. So that's basically this video on, um, on doing conceptual models. Um, so we have gone from reality, we have been using this Peter Broyko's uh, Hunters in the Snow as an example of our reality. And then we have been talking about creating different ontologies or and these ontologies then define our conceptual model of our world of discourse. So we know that our reality contains much more than what we need. Uh, but whenever we do a model of something, we close our eyes for different details we are not interesting. Um, the important is to only have the details of importance and leave the rest out. So hope you liked the video. See you in another video. Bye.